Well, with December 25th in our past and the celebration of Jesus' birth, and even though it can become very secular, uh, how many of you received the greatest gift you have ever received this Christmas? One, two, three. There, we're coming. All right. Good. How many of you got the worst gift you've ever received? And yeah, no, don't raise your hand because the person that gave it to you is probably sitting next to you, maybe. Well, good to see all of you here today. I want to welcome those who are watching online. I would like to make an announcement that our internet congregation is, is growing, and it continues to grow. Uh, as far as we can tell, the consistent watchers uh, are at least half this size. So if that continues to grow this year, our, our viewers will be this size or larger. Praise God for that. And w what an easy thing to do to spread the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So... Here it is, December 28th. This is the last sermon for 2014. I know to you that's like, really? But for me, as I look at my calendar and I look ahead, this is it for 2014. And, and when, I, when I look at the sermons that have been prepared over the last four years, it was the reason today is titled what it is, Clearly Seen. Today's message is about inner perspective. If you do not have the correct inner perspective, you, you have made no commitments. Your inner perspective is determined by your commitments. And today we're going to talk about commitments because I can tell you where you're going to be in 20 years according to the commitments that you make today. Four and a half years ago, there were a group of people that sat down in the basement of a living room, felt very much called by the work of the Holy Spirit that this church was to be launched. We were committed to making this thing happen because God said yes, we said go. The commitment that we made then still carries today, and it's probably stronger today than it ever has been. Your commitments determine your inner perspective. But here's the rub. Commitments take work. Commitment takes dedication, takes time, takes energy, takes willpower, takes desire. So today we're going to research the commitments that you're making. And like I said, you tell me your commitments, I'll tell you where you're going to be at 10 years from now. Will this church be here 10 years from now because of the commitment of this fellowship right here? Yes, it will be. Amen? Amen. Because we're committed to it. But today it's about what you are committed to. Let's look at Mark chapter Eight. How about that? Almost forgot the text already. <laughs> Mark chapter 8, starting at verse number 22. Now this is coming from a Hebraic Roots Bible, uh, very similar to the original language, called the One New Man Bible, and I'm going to explain to you the reason I'm using that. Uh, but to, to take this apart, Mark chapter 8, and if you have your Bible with you, uh, turn to 8 verse 22. They came into Bethsaida. They brought to him a blind man and begged him. Now, isn't, isn't that interesting? Now, how, how many of us would honestly say, I'm going to beg Jesus today? Nobody? See, it's not in our culture. It, it's not in our minds. It's not in our perspective, our inner perspective to beg Jesus. Yet, we're going to learn that it's probably okay. They begged him that he would touch him. I love that. Jesus, please touch him. The man. Then taking the hand of the blind man, he led him outside of the village, and having spit in his eyes after he had placed his hand on him, he was asking him, Do you see anything? And when he looked up, he was saying, I see men that are as trees I see walking. So he didn't quite see clearly, did he? Verse number 25, Then he again laid hands upon his eyes, and he stared straight ahead, and he was restored. And he was looking at everything clearly. And he sent him to his house saying, Do not enter the village. Inner perspective. Here's your first takeaway if you're a note taker today. Are you committed to spiritual growth? There's a group of people in this text that have no names. But they're committed to spiritual growth. We don't know who they are. Look at the very first verse, verse number 22. They came to Bethsaida. They brought to him. We don't know who they are, but listen to me loud and clear. You need a they in your life. You need someone who takes you 
seriously and says, I'm going to help you on your journey. You need a they to come alongside you to bring you to a place where your inner perspective becomes clear. And the, the beautiful thing about this is we're not talking about physical sight. We're talking about inner sight. We're not talking about being able to see with your physical eyes. We're talking about inner spiritual vision, your inner perspective. Because this comes at a time in the text where Jesus was trying to teach the disciples who he was. They couldn't see it. This happens. And then Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, why, you are the Christ. Two verses later, he condemns him. Peter, you still didn't get it. Now here's what's really cool is because Bethsaida is not your normal town. Bethsaida is a fishing port developed by Rome. It's on the coast, and this is a rough bunch. Bethsaida is a man's town. Here's where they clean fish. Here's where men get together. Here's where sweaty men hang out. Here's where men talk. You ever been in the back of a shop where it's men talk? You know what I'm talking about, guys? Yeah? Okay, there's those kind of places. This whole town was like that. There's only certain kind of women that hang out in Bethsaida. I don't have to say any more. That was the group. And here's what's really interesting is four of the disciples came from Bethsaida. When you read where the guys are from. Peter, Philip, James came from Bethsaida. So this is a rough place. And yet here's where this story happens. And they grab this man, and they bring him to Jesus. Are you committed to spiritual growth? Will you do whatever it takes for yourself to grow spiritually? Remember I said inner perspective takes work. When's the last time you sat down with the Bible? When's the last time you sat down in prayer and said, God, show me to me? Not one amen. I didn't expect one, but I'm saying When's the last time you did that? Because unless we look at self, unless we turn inward and look at the inner perspective, we don't know who we are. They wanted this man to do that. They knew Jesus was coming to town, so they brought him to Jesus. They wanted him to change. You need a they in your life. When's the last time somebody came alongside you and said, hey, you, you need to go to this Bible study. You need to be in worship because I'm concerned about you. You know, one of the things about commitment over the last four and a half years is a Bible study that we have going on in Great Bend. Men are coming to this Bible study. Men are sharing. Men are saying, hey, you need to be here. This is a powerful group. This is where we're learning about ourselves. We're learning about God. There's one in Russell. There's one in Hankinson. Talk about commitment. That, that's a commitment of the fellowship to say, we want to learn about ourselves. And men need men. Men need to learn about themselves. And that's the environment that this is happening. The other thing that if, if you're not willing to look at your inner perspective, look at who you're hanging with. Sick people hang out with sick people. Hurt people hang out with hurt people. And hurt people hurt people. So unless you're learning about yourself, just, just look around. Who are you hanging with? And that can say a lot about who you're with and how you're thinking and how you're acting. So there's a group of people. They go to this guy, and they bring him to Jesus. Now, Jesus cured and healed blind people more than any other miracle in all the New Testament. You ever wonder why? I mean, blind physically, blind spiritually, it's pretty easy to understand. Jesus didn't heal these people physically to cure a disease. I mean, if, if, if that would have been cured, we would, have been, we would not have blind people today. We still have blind people. Jesus didn't heal all sorts of things to cure dis diseases. Jesus healed in the physical to move you in the spiritual. Are you committed to spiritual growth? is my question that we have to start out with because Jesus brought a living sign to a dying world. And he still does that today. So as you end 2014, can you honestly sit back here today and say, hey, I understand what's going on here. I'm willing to commit this year to my inner perspective and to be willing to spiritually grow. If anybody here is willing to spiritually grow this year, you can say Amen. amen. If you don't, you're dead. How about that? Because if we don't grow inwardly, we will die outwardly. It's the blindness on the outside 
That's the issue? No. It's the blindness on the inside. And what a greater person to give us an example of this, and this needs to be part of your prayer, is Paul. Ephesians 1, 17 and 19. Here's what Paul says. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I love Paul's writing. I mean, if, if just, just take your time and listen to the words. Yahweh of Yahshua, the Father of Jesus, is the Father of glory. In other words, he's elevating God the Father and Jesus. He says, listen, here they are. And this is what he wants for you. This is your inner perspective. May give you. Okay, there it goes. He's not talking about eyesight and the physical. He's talking about spiritual. That this God the Father of Jesus may give you the spirit of wisdom. Take this verse this year, highlight it in your Bible, put it on your refrigerator, and pray this verse every day. Last year, and we're going to talk about this on the New Year's Eve service this coming Wednesday night, uh, I challenged the group that was there to read the book of Ephesians at least once a week. And this is the prayer that we need to be praying, that he'll give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Wow. Wow. How many of you want the wisdom and knowledge of God the Father? Amen. And that's what Paul says here. He says, pray this prayer that we receive the wisdom, revelation, and knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. There's your inner perspective. Did you know that your spirit has eyes? Did you know that your understanding has eyes? That's what he's saying. He's not talking in the physical. He's talking in the spiritual. Your inner man can be enlightened to see have the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. How many of you can honestly say here as we end 214, maybe that will be your resolution, I'm not into resolutions. You know why most resolutions don't come to pass and don't work is because I just read the other day that we make too many. You know how many resolutions you're supposed to make? One. You know how many add-ons you do to, you know, okay, I'm going to do this. And then subcategory, this and this and this, will happen because of this. You only make one resolution with two subcategories, and guess what? It will probably happen. So here's your resolution. Pray this prayer every day so you know the hope that you're called to. I said that to ask you this. Do you know what you're called to? See, if you don't know your inner perspective, you don't know what you're called to. Here's what happens. People make commitments to worldly issues. If you make commitments to worldly issues, I'm going to be famous. I'm going to make the most money I could ever make. I'm going to make more money than everybody in the whole wide world. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be a good public speaker. What, if you make worldly commitments, you become frustrated, full of fear, and angry. Or if you make no commitments at all, you become frustrated, fearful, and angry. So that's why Paul says, pray this prayer so you know what you're called to. When you know what you're called to, you're going to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Who are the saints? Those who confess to believe. Do you know what you're called to? Do you receive the riches and glory of the inheritance? Verse number 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Folks, there's enough in this prayer to set you for life on this side of heaven. Inner perspective. Man, to the, the greatness that's beyond our understanding with the power, it's the dunamis power. This is the same power that comes up when he talks about the Holy Spirit. The, the power toward us who believe. How many of you went sideways this year once in a while? Yeah, we all did. Didn't get any hand raisers on that either. How many of you stayed on the track all year? We, we, we go off and God gets us back. And that's what he's talking about towards the power of us to believe. Are, are we a bunch of believers here? Yes. This is available for us. This is the inner perspective that we fail to look at. According to the work of his great might. You see, what's going on around you is not your problem. It's what's going on in you. That's the problem. And so many times we don't want to look at what's going on in here because you know what? This hurts. This is painful. This is the real deal in here. Sit in front of the mirror and say, do I know me? But 
before you let God say anything to you, pray this prayer so he can reveal this to you. Are you committed to spiritual growth? They went and brought him to Jesus. Now, here's where it really gets weird. They begged Jesus. They begged him. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. They brought to him a blind man and begged him. You see, we, we have this stoic traditional thing that in my humility, I only come before God with, with, uh, with a countenance that I'm lesser, he's greater, which is true, but I don't dare ask God because God freely gives. I don't beg God because if he's going to do it, it'll happen anyway. So we come before God groveling almost, would you please do this for me, God? That's not biblical. In fact, if you're saved and the spirit of the living God lives inside of you, he tells us in the Bible to come to him and ask for whatever you want with the confidence that he will give us the immeasurable greatness and the power. So we can honestly go before God and say, God, I need this. I think God likes that. You know what that says to him? Is he says, you know who you are. You're a child of mine. And you can ask for what you need and want. God wants to supply both. So it's not what's going on in the world around you that's your problem. It's what's going on inside of you. And if you're groveling at the end of the year here and you're, you're cowering before God and you're coming before him, your inner perspective is jaded. The enemy's been telling you lies. And you can honestly sit back and say, no, I am a child of the king. I am committed to spiritual growth. And I ask for the wisdom of the revelation of the knowledge of God so that the eyes of my understanding will be opened. Who wrote this? Paul. Here's a guy who was committed to, to, the, to the work of the Jewish nation. He's riding his horse to Damascus one day. And what did God do to him? He closed his physical eyes... That's why we're not talking about the physical to open his inner spiritual eyes. Everything went dark in the outside world, but the light came on on the inside world for Paul. He sat in Motel 6 on Straight Street for three days, and God says, here's the deal. You can sit on the corner with a tin cup and a white cane with sunglasses for the rest of your life and let the spiritual light go out and keep your physical light, or I'll give you back your spiritual light and your physical sight if you work for me for the rest of your life. Now, that's a no-brainer. So are you committed to spiritual growth? As you end 2014, that's my challenge, the first one, that your inner perspective is committed to spiritual growth. This church is not where it's at today because we were not committed. We're here today. We're doing what we're doing. Internet congregation, all of you sitting here because we're committed. And we get this. They brought him to Jesus. Now, here's what's going to happen. If you're committed to spiritual growth, you're standing in front of Jesus, he's going to ask you to go. Look at what he did. They brought him to Jesus, they begged him that he would touch him, and here's what Jesus does. Jesus walks up to the guy, and he takes his hand, and he says, let's leave. Let's leave town. This is a curse on Bethsaida. Many people don't realize it, but when Jesus took the healing outside of town, literally what he's saying is this town is so bad that they don't want to listen to me, they're unwilling to change, and I'm not going to do this healing in this town because this environment is so negative, I'm going to take you outside of town, and I'm going to do the healing out there. Could it be that your environment is infecting and affecting your spiritual growth. I'm not saying God's telling you to move today. I'm telling you that your inner perspective needs to be correct. And if God is saying your environment is causing you to be stalemated, is causing you to stop growth, God says, let's move. And that's biblical. What did he do with Abraham? Abraham called up and God and him have this relationship and he says the world's going to be blessed through you. You're, you're the whole... Christian nation's going to come after you, Abraham, and he moved him away from his crazy relatives. I'm not saying that I had crazy relatives, but Ginger and I moved when we were called into the ministry. 
because I know a lot of you are watching today. <laughs> but I'm saying that God will cause you to be spiritually in a perspective to grow, and when you start to grow, you've got to be willing to move. Notice where we're worshiping. You've got to be willing to move. He took him by the hand and he led him outside of the town. Now, if you love where you're at, it can be a huge distraction. If you really like everything that's going on in your life, but God says, come on, come, come, I'm going to take your hand, let's go for a walk. Yeah, but I can't give up job, I can't give up house, I can't give up farm. See, all of a sudden, what you love on the external can be a, a distraction for the internal growth. And that becomes a real tension. But if you go back and pray the prayer in Ephesians that you're going to gain wisdom and revelation and know the hope of what he's called to, you go with no fear. Some of you sitting here today have probably been called into the ministry, but you're not liking it. I mean, really, God? Jesus led him outside of the city to be healed. Could it be that the condition in Bethsaida was so bad that Jesus says, hey, these people don't want to listen to me? We're going outside of town for your healing. Sometimes God will move you, and you got to be okay with that. Sometimes the only place that the healing can happen is after he moves you. Some of you are sitting here today because you have moved into this area and you felt very called to that. Ginger and I feel very called to this because this is where the Holy Spirit wants us. You know our story. I'd still like to preach someplace where it's warm 365 days of the year. That's irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. When God calls you to move, he says, my knowledge, my spirit, my spiritual growth for you is better than what you understand. Inner perspective. Here's what he does. He brings the guy out. He literally, taking the man by the hand, leads him out of town, led him outside of the village, and spit in his eye. I mean, really? You're going to lead me outside of town, and you're going to, you know, and, and the, the verbiage here is not an eyelid closed. Jesus literally went up to the guy, pulled his eye open, <laughs> I mean, that, that's pretty gross, right? You ever been spit on? Yep, probably by an animal. You ever been spit on by a human? That's gross. But yet Jesus spits in his eye. You know what he's saying? He says God's trash has more power than anything that's in Bethsaida. This roughneck town, my spit, will do more power than anything that's going on in the town. And you're, you're trying to have a relationship with your environment. You're trying to do worldly things when God says, no, I want to pull you out. He got him out. He spit in his eye. And what I find interesting when I read this story is after having spit in his eye, the blind man got really upset. It doesn't read that way. How many of you would get upset if I walked up to you, pulled your glasses off your face, held your eye open, and spit in your eye? You'd probably punch me, right? Right? But you, you know what the deal is here? Is because when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if somebody says, my spit in your eye can heal you, you'll let them do it. When you finally get to a point when life is so sideways, so down, so bad, whatever it takes, go ahead and bring it on. Jesus, if a spit in the eye is going to heal my eyesight, do it. I'm okay with that. Have you ever been to that point? I think some of you have been. I've been there, but Jesus didn't spit in my eye to heal me. But he will do whatever it takes to make the point. It wasn't the physical healing that's going on here. It's the desperation of his condition that he was willing to move, to spiritually grow, to look at the inner inspect perspective to heal me. Go ahead, Jesus, put it right in the eye. Other, what he's saying is, go ahead, Jesus, put it right in the sorrow. Put it right in the pain. Put it right in the dysfunction. Put it right where I need it. Because I'm tired of being sick and tired. Are you willing to let God challenge your inner perspective today? 
I mean, let's just, let's just be serious with each other for a moment. I know we're a fellowship that does that anyway. But are you willing to let God put it right where it's needed? I mean, let's end 2014 with honesty. Let's end with 2014 saying, God, I need this. Please, I beg you to fix it. God asks that of us. And I think we don't get to see his power, his might, his wisdom, his revelation until we do that. Are you willing to spiritually grow? Are you willing to spiritually go? This determines the depth of his inner healing. You know why? Number one, he didn't get angry. Number two, there's nothing in this text that says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're going to spit my eye? I pass. Would you do that to Jesus? Maybe you have. Maybe Jesus has sat you down and, listen, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, No, pass Jesus. We do that all the time. Some of you God has called to move. Some of you God has asked to do this in your marriage. Some of you have been asked to do this with your children. No, 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 no. That's too much work. That's too much to ask of me, Jesus. Let me go back to Bethsaida. Let me go back to my dysfunction. Let me go back and live in the pit of the pain, and I'll be just fine. We're not going to end 2014 like that. We're going to let God put it right into the sorrow, right where it's needed. And he spits in his eye, and here's what happens. He places his hand on him. He spits in his eye, and then he asks him, do you see anything? There's my favorite verb. That's the reason I use the one new man Hebrew translation is because the word see here is my favorite verb in the New Testament and it's not hara, it's adon. He says, do you see with an understanding? The guy's honest. What does he say? No. When he looked up, he says, I see men walking as if they're trees. I see men like trees walking. I see men that are as trees I see walking. There, I'll get it right Are you comfortable enough in your spirit, in your inner perspective, that when God touches you and God heals you, you can honestly say to God, it wasn't complete? You're talking to the creator of the universe. And are you willing to say, God, I need more? That's intense. And I'll never forget sitting in seminary. We had to translate the book of Mark and the book of Galatians. And, and my, my Hebrew uh, Greek teacher, Pastor John Kildee, he was one of my, my, the greatest teachers I've ever sat under. He is now serving a church out in uh, North Dakota, Jamestown, North Dakota, under one of, one of my classmates. He, he was a great teacher. And I'm, I'm not saying anything bad about Pastor Kildee. But if, if you ever study a text... And in your study notes, if you have a wonderful study Bible, you know, in the 21st century, we get all this stuff that's amazing. And if you have a study Bible, and all of a sudden you're reading it, and it skips the verses, ha, they didn't know what was going on either. Notice that in your Bible when you read it. Every time you come up to something that's difficult or challenging, it skips it. There's nothing there. I have access to 26 commentaries in my, in my library and like four on the shelf that I never look at anymore. It's all electronic. None of them touch on this fact that this man needed a second touch. Why, why else did it end up like this? Because it wasn't complete. And I firmly believe, and the reason I talked to you about Pastor Kildee is the fact that he said that about this. He says, you know, there's something going on in this text that we don't know about that this man had to ask for a second touch. Because he said, listen, Jesus, these guys look like trees. And I'm not willing to settle and go through life half healed. Now, I'm going to throw something out here that is saved, but you still need recovery. When we get saved, we receive all of the Holy Spirit, right? That's what the Bible says. But we can be saved and still need more. We can be saved and still need to be enlightened. We can be saved but still need to recover. That's what's going on here. 
We honestly can be saved, but we have to go and say, I need more. When's the last time in your prayer time you went to Jesus and say, I, I can see this thing, but I can't see all of it. And I think God, in his sovereignty and in his grace, loves that. He touched this guy. He spit in his eye. He was better, but he wasn't whole. He was healed, but he wasn't complete. He could see men walking around as trees. He was in the first stage of recovery. And I really believe that this represents almost all Christians. I really do. Because I have watched in 14 years more people that confess to believe and live in misery. Not you guys. You're an amazing bunch. I love all of you. But you know somebody that I'm talking about. You know a Christian, solid Christian, born again believer, but just not content. Their inner perspective is off. Everything's jaded. The world is dark. Maybe the world's even flat. They're, they're just wrong. They're saved, but they're still in need of recovery. Are you willing to spiritually grow? Are you willing to spiritually go? And in the going, are you willing to confess to Jesus, I need more? Now, I know this goes totally against everything that we've been taught. I mean, do we challenge God? Do we challenge the Holy Spirit and say, I need more? According to this text, yes, we do. He had the chance to settle, but he didn't do it. I love that. I mean, he had a chance to say, you know what, before I couldn't see anything, but now I can see men like trees. That's okay. 50% Jesus is all right. Some of you are living there. You know why we live there? It's because if we go back and say, Jesus, I need more. I need the complete touch. I want to be healed. I want to see it all. Is It scares the living life right out of us. That's the only reason I can think that we don't do it. We're actually afraid of what God has for us. And then there's this other group that says, hey, I can't quite see it all. Give it, come on, Jesus, give me some more. Because I want all of it. Which one are you? Are you afraid to receive all that he has for you? See, we're not going to end 2014 sliding by under the wire. We're going to end 2014 asking God for everything that he has for us and for this fellowship, and you're here today. Go ahead and spit it into the sorrow, into the place. I will be willing to confess I need all of it. Now, here's your gauge. Your inner perspective, how you look at other people, tells you where you're at. And the only reason I can say that is because he uses men. I see men that are as trees I see walking. How do you view people? You know, there's a lot of people that don't like people. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a way to make this really nice. But <laughs> some people just don't like other people. And I've even had people say, I hope they're not in heaven because I don't want to spend eternity with them. How you view people is determined how your inner perspective and how healed you are. How do you view other people? Jesus, you spit in my eye, you healed me, I, I, I got this thing fairly good, but you know what, I'm still controlling Jesus, you did the work, but you know what? I'm, I'm still frustrated. I'm still mad. I'm still full of fear. You go down the list. What part of your personality in your inner perspective is still off, and that's what you're willing to say that you don't want healed because I'm willing to hang on to myself. I'm healed, but I'm not whole, and I'm okay with that. I'm not letting you out of here today like that. Because that, that's not why he came. When you go back to Ephesians 1, he says, reveal the wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge. So I don't care who you are, what you're doing, how you're acting. I can see you through the love and the blood of Jesus the Christ, and I can love you. How you view people determines how your inner perspective is. 
This man wasn't satisfied. He says, I'm halfway there, but I want to be whole. I see men walking around as trees, and here's the other thing that I believe happens. If you run off half-cocked, and you've been touched by the hand of God, and all of a sudden you think you know it all, everything you touch is contaminated because you're only halfway there. And if you're going to go about doing, and you're only halfway there, you're not going to be preaching and teaching the good news correctly. I've watched this happen a lot. And you, you can see these guys on TV. I mean, you see this all over the place. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not calling a judgment call on them. I'm just saying that they've been touched by God. And whoa, you know, all of a sudden they're off on a tangent over here. And you listen to them, it's like, whoa, dude. You know, but there is one thing that I do like. And for you, for me, all of you fall into that category. You're all a bunch of crazy Christians. And I love it. Because you're willing to come and take an hour or two out of your busy week. You're willing to come and say, yes, I'm willing to spiritually grow. I'm willing to spiritually grow. And you fall into that category of crazy Christians. And I've seen a lot of crazy people. I've seen crazy drunks. I've seen crazy race car drivers, crazy farmers. Right? Amen? Amen? But when you get crazy for Jesus and you're willing to ask him for the second touch, now you're really crazy in a good way. Finish it off, Jesus. Let's do this thing. Let's, let's get on the same track. Jesus says, come here and let me finish what I started. And why did he finish what he started? Because he asked. We've got to lose that old mindset. Do you see anything? Yes, men walk in his trees. And then again, he laid hands upon his eyes, and he stared straight ahead, and he was restored. That just gives me chill bumps. Here's what's really cool. You know, churches get into these weird things where everybody's got to come down front and confess to receive Jesus, and we'll lay hands on, and we'll dump a quart of oil on you, and all this stuff. And Jesus doesn't have any system here. And I think he teaches that because he says it's not systematic, so you don't make a religion out of it. First he spit in his eye, but the second time he didn't spit in his eye. Then he just laid hands on you see, however the healing's going to come, Jesus says, listen, be open to the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to lay hands on, lay hands on. A little oil, a little oil, a little prayer. A little... He'll work however. And he doesn't do the same thing twice, but he does it a second time, and he's healed. Are you willing to spiritually grow? Are you willing to spiritually go? And when you do that, you will be committed to spiritual greatness that only Jesus Christ can offer. Now, I don't know about you. I want to live in the spiritual greatness. And this goes back to your Ephesians text. This goes back to the fact that I will have the wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of my heart enlightened. Now, here's, here's how Jesus leaves it. This man is saying, Jesus... Put her here right where I need it. Heal me completely because I want to be like you. Now, I've been accused of being a kingdom now preacher, and you know that that's not true because I don't believe in the kingdom now. None of us here, that's not in the Bible. But when I say I want to be like you, that's the sanctification process, and God says, listen, we grow into Christ, and sanctification is day after day after day. I become more like you, and I want to be more like you, and the only way I can be more like you is if I'm completely healed by you. And if he's going to mentor me, I want all that he has for me. If he's going to mentor me, I want to see like he sees. If he's going to mentor me, I want to walk like he walks. Not like I walk. Does that make sense? Because when you're a mentor, you want to do what your mentor is doing. I want to believe like you believe. I want to have the faith like you have. And now he can go and do it. I want to understand like you understand. I came this morning to serve notice to the enemy because so many of us are walking around half healed. And today's your day. Today's your day just to simply ask to be healed in Jesus' name, whole and complete. So I don't leave here half blind. 
He gives us one more bullet at the end. You know what it is. He heals him. He asks for it. He sent him to his house saying, don't go back. When we close our service today, or, or right now in a few minutes here, we're going to hold hands so no one is left untouched because of touch from God. You're going to make a commitment that I want my inner perspective to be correct for 2015, and I will not go back. You know how bad I wanted to go back to agriculture? It's horrible. I even had it all figured out how I could do both. And here it is 12 years later, God blesses us with an opportunity to live on an acreage where I still get to play in the dirt, get greasy, and break my fingers on wrenches. But it wasn't until, hey, that, that's a true story. <laughs> you believe me. Do you know how, how many muscles you have in your hands? And you ever shake a farmer's hand? You ever, you ever shake an old school farmer's hand? I'll put it that way. Some of you guys don't have hands anymore because you don't even do anything with your hands. When I helped in, in, our, in our congregation in Iowa serve communion, this one guy put his hands out. And I mean, I have big hands, and my hand fit inside of his hand. His fingers were like this big. You know, but when you use your hands, the muscles in your hands develop, and you have big, muscular hands. And six months after we leave the farm, Ginger's holding my hand, you know, because we do that all the time. And she goes, wow. Your hands are soft. And I, I didn't take it as a compliment. She thought it was awesome. It's like my hands are gone. So now today I'm still in the country, living on the farm, getting to play with my wrenches, and I, I don't have any biceps anymore either. I don't lift anything. So I try to pull on stuff, you know, and I take both hands. Oh, I break blood vessels in my hands. They'll be all blue. It's like, where did it go? So share that story with you because if you're not willing to spiritually grow, you lose it, right? You got to spiritually grow. You got to spiritually go. You got to be willing to stay at it because this is a commitment. And when you're committed to the spiritual growth, guess what God does? He brings it back around and he blesses us with the opportunity to have what we had before. A little smaller scale. It's all good. So, are you willing to look at the inner perspective Keep your mouth shut and don't go back. Don't go back. Some of you sitting here have, have dealt with alcoholism, pornography, adultery, drugs, cheating, lying, stealing. The list can go on. But he says when you've been healed and you've had a touch from the hand of God, don't you go back. Because I, God, have healed you from it. And if you do go back, there's forgiveness. Just say, hey, God, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. And he says, you're forgiven in Jesus' name. Go that way. But don't go back into the village. Do not enter the village. You can go anywhere you want to go. Just don't go backwards. Amen? Don't go back. Those are powerful words. Addiction counselors, any sort of counseling, to me, in our eyes, don't do it. But we know how the enemy works. We know how hard the temptation is. So when you're tempted to go back, put it right here, Jesus. Put it right there, right in the spot where I need it, and he'll heal you. That's where we're going to end 2014. With the understanding that our inner perspective is correct. We want to grow. We want to go. And we want to walk in the spiritual greatness that God has for us. We want it. Let's say that together. We want it. We want it. And he'll give it in his grace and his mercy. So to leave no one untouched, and I know some of you are on the fringes. You might have to slide in a little bit. Uh, we, we might have to, let's stand to do it because so we can gap the bridge the gap in the center. But let's grab a hand of everybody here so no one is untouched. Center, okay, we got, one, we, we got two groups. We're divided. We're unity. We're one body. So, Gary, you got to get over here. So we're, we're unity. We're, we're together. So we're, we're unbroken. 
It's okay to move in church. There. Everybody touching somebody? I'm still a little weak. Everybody touching somebody. Okay, everybody's touching somebody. So, the inner perspective is what we're looking at. So as you end 2014, I'm asking you right now before God, I'll, I'll open in prayer and you finish the prayer, that what God wants to heal in your life to make that inner perspective of him correct, you ask him today. Say, Jesus, I've been touched. I've been touched, but things still look like trees walking around. I don't have all of it. I want all of it today. I'm going to end this year, and I'm going to push forward in 2015 being touched by the hand of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the love and the grace and the mercy that you offer. Father, the words in this story are so encouraging. You sandwich it in between uh, the disciples wanting to see it but not seeing it, but we live on the other side of it, and we know that we have the right to see it clearly. Father, I pray for this fellowship today as we end this year and we're going to launch into 2015. And all of us sitting here have that area in our life that's not complete. We've been saved, but we're not whole. Father, I know you're listening to us, and I just stop here for a minute, and I let you fill in the blank as individuals to say, this is the area of my life that's not complete. This is the area of my life that I want healed, and I ask you to do it today, Jesus. I let you finish that prayer. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. Some of the people here are scared. They're scared of who they can become. They're scared the past will pull them back. They're scared that you're going to move them. So I pray in the strong name of Jesus that all those fears are gone. All the healing has already happened. And we step out in faith believing you have made us whole. And we will not go back. We thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.